why decide to go fishing instead of attend the draft mm -hmm. when you know you would have had the opportunity mm -hmm. to you know be there and on national tv mm -hmm. have your name called in the front <laughs> of the world the idea of um going to new york for five days and kind of being paraded around by the nfl as they you know make money off your every step and the whole purpose is just for publicity for me to stand there in a suit and go hey look at me everybody you know give the commissioner a hug and everything i was like why would i want to do that that sounds horrible i can't imagine a reason why anybody would want to do that but people most, do it every year i mean most people, most people are do excited it. And, and actually it, yeah. actually the nfl was like shocked that i didn't want to do it and i'm like that doesn't sound like fun that sounds <laughs> horrible like i just like football and i like hanging out with my friends and stuff and this sounds horrible. I don't even own a suit. I mean, how, where am I going to get a suit for to go to the draft <laughs> in New York? And at that time, I didn't really have a lot of experience in big cities. And right. I've never been to New York before. And I was like, that's a big, scary place. Why would I want to go to New York? Like, that's where people go to die. Like, this is, <laughs> oh, I can't do this. <laughs> and and uh, on top of that, it was it was like your last kind of opportunity to spend some time with your family and your old life is right around the draft. And so I didn't want to miss that opportunity to be able to enjoy an afternoon fishing with my dad, which is something that we had done growing up a ton of times on Lake Michigan. And it was funny that it kind of turned into more of an attention thing than I expected, and then maybe even more than if I would have gone to the draft, because nobody would be talking about me on draft day if I would have gone to the draft. Right. But since I didn't go, it became a story unintentionally. What did the NFL say when they found out you were declining? Well, so Gil Brandt, who is a legendary NFL scout sure. for the Cowboys, and now he works for Come the on. NFL and the Combine and all that stuff. Great guy, um, great scout. But he was kind of in charge of deciding who gets to go to the draft. And at that time, it was five players, maybe. And so I was one of the five players selected and they sent you the letter from Gil and it's, hey, congratulations, you're gonna come to the draft on behalf of the NFL, great job, buddy. And I was like, okay, no, I'm not. So I just like threw the letter away or whatever. And uh, you know, a couple of weeks later, I'm, I'm getting all these calls from this number from, I don't even know where it was from. And I pick it up and it's you know Gil and he's like, you have to come to the draft. Nobody's ever turned it down. And then it started turning into the, the teams are gonna think you're a prima donna and they're not gonna wanna draft you anymore because you, you're shunning the draft. And, and they tried to turn it into like me seeking attention or me uh, trying to pull something on the NFL or being anti-establishment or whatever they were trying to accuse me of being to try to coerce me into showing up at the draft. And I, th I really thank my agent, Peter Schaefer, for just being real upfront about it and saying, look, these guys are just BSing you. They're just doing what they can to try to get you there because they need the actors for their TV show right. to show up so that they can sell tickets and get people to watch on TV. I mean. Basically, they have millions of viewer audience that are watching this show, and they need characters in their show. They need actors. Right. And so they need cheap actors. And what's better than cheap actors is free actors. And they get all these players to show up for free, and then they become part of the soap opera of the NFL, which is, which is great for some guys. The guy that goes first overall and holds that jersey up, he's happy, his family's there, and, you know, Everyone gives him the pat on the back and he gets to hug the commissioner or has to hug the commissioner now. <laughs> uh, but then there's the guy that just plummets in the draft and he's there sweating it out and he's got five cameras in his face. Your and teammate, once teammate Brady Quinn. Exactly. And a couple years before that, Aaron Rodgers. And right. I saw that and that left an impression on me. You know, for, for them to abuse a player like that that's doing that for free, uh, I thought was... It was really tough, and I was like, at that time, a young guy, I was thinking to myself too, I don't know if I could handle that. I mean, that would be emotionally crushing. I mean, mm -hmm. you become the story of the draft, and your failure is the story of the draft, and that becomes the reason people watch the draft, is to watch you sweat. That, that sounds terrible. For free! Right. Can't believe it. If you knew you were gonna go number one, would you have gone? No, okay. uh, I, like even that, like I, I could see the guy that really loves attention, mm -hmm. you know, would want to be on TV, get his face up there, maybe get his Nike commercial or his Under Armour commercial or Snickers or whatever he wants to sell. You know, that's great for him. 
that's just that's just not exactly who I am. Um, so but back to your original question. Wait, so I that, that, really that, means, off a so that means you're saying if the guy the Browns draft uh, first overall this year goes to the draft, he's uh, an attention seeker. Well, there's a lot of them out there these days. You know, huh. there was no social media when I was a rookie. So right. these kids are a little different these days. To describe the moment uh, when you're on the out fishing with your dad mm -hmm. of getting the call. Well, it was a fun day, but it was interesting because. Um, Originally, my plan was I was going to go hunting because I just didn't want any cameras around. And my agent's like, you can't do that. They need to be able to call you before they draft you because I guess many years ago, one team accidentally drafted a player that had passed away. And so now they want to make sure when five minutes before they draft you, they want to call you and make sure you're alive, first of all. And they also want to make sure that Nothing has changed in your situation since the last time they talked to you, which was probably a couple days ago. They want to make sure that on, if the draft Saturday, on Friday night, you didn't go out and go to the bar and get arrested for beating somebody up, and now they're drafting you, and uh, you're, you've got an arrest on your record that they don't know about. Right. So they need to be able to contact you. So he was like, you can't go hunting by yourself. Like, you can't do it. So I was like, well, can I go fishing? He's like, well, if you can have cell service and if you can listen to the draft on the radio to kind of listen along. So on the boat that we were on, they had the radio on and they got like XM radio or something where they could get the draft on there. So we could listen to the draft and I had a cell phone and we had to kind of troll in the boat close enough to cell phone towers <laughs> where, we, where if they needed to call me, we could right. like pick it up and it, was right after the second pick where Cleveland called me when they were on the clock and and said, hey, you know, this is Romeo Cornell, this is Phil Savage. We want to congratulate you on becoming a Cleveland Brown. And at that point, you know, I was, woo -hoo, we were hooping it up and high-fiving. And at that point, um, my agent called and, and he said, uh, hey, we need to get back to shore because Cleveland's flying you as soon as you can to Cleveland for like a press conference. And so at that moment, the whirlwind started and um, it was just as crazy as I expected it right after that.